Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Who am I? So, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with a big one. My name is Fred Wormsley. I am uh, nearly 75. I was born in 1946, a small cotton town in Lancashire called Bacup, which is uh, the end of the world, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to tell us about your early childhood memories? Early childhood memories? I mean, I was uh, the third child of a... Of Four, a family of four children, middle child I suppose. Yeah, happy memories really. Just after the war, not a lot about. My father wasn't a skilled person, just a working class, a driver, coal man, dustbin man, he did a bit of everything. I think his escape was he, he used to ride Speedway and uh, a wall of death at Bellevue and he was a bit of a lunatic on a motorcycle, which was in grounding me all my life really. But early childhood, yeah, just lots of families, big family, my dad had, uh, quite a lot of brothers and sisters. My mum had uh, no brothers but three sisters. They all had children at similar times. Uh, I think we were all part of the baby boom after the Second World War. You know, I think the uh, second thing my dad did when he got home, we took his rucksack off, I think. But there we are, we were all there. and <clears throat> Quite a happy childhood, really, with no money. And there were always uh, things happening in the house with my dad being involved with motorcycles and friends who had motorcycles. And, People were always calling around for a chat and stuff like that. And did work on motorbikes and when they talk about rolling up the line home, pushing the settee forward with the couch as we knew it, to bring a motorbike in, to fiddle with it and do like that. And I could kneel on the, the settee of the couch, looking over the back of it, watching. It was quite a happy childhood, really. My grandfather had a farm just up the road, and uh, just a hill farm. And, which we used to go to, because we'd go with my dad on his motorbike, with, with my elder brother sat on the pillion and me sat on the tank. And in them days, the early 50s, you could just set off up the road like that, no crash helmets, nothing. You know, three people on a motorbike wasn't unusual. We used to, my dad used to take me to see my grandparents and get some eggs and bits and pieces and back home. And in the early days at school, we tend to move about a lot, so I never like got a, a steady sort of an education. But again, you know, it was adequate at the time. And I think when I was about seven years old, I mean, we lived in Bacup all this time. My parents decided to up sticks and move to a place called Leyland, which is the famous Leyland Motors, Leyland Wagon. It was only like a small town then. I think it wasn't even a borough, just between the village and the town. But it, it had uh, massive factories, which I suppose were from the war. My father had a brother, my, his elder, one of his older brothers, my Uncle Dick, who lived in Leyland, so we just moved to Upstick to one day and my dad had a van and my Uncle Dick brought his wagon and they loaded everything up and we arrived in Leyland, which was a bit odd. Most of my childhood memories come from when I was in Leyland. It's just with it being a busy industrial town, everything was going on. School was just down the road. When I was nine, I, I broke my right leg. We, we were having a competition, me and a friend at a local market that wasn't running. They had big tubular stands and big things that came out to check the canvas on the top and we decided to do a hand-to-hand -hand thing race across it he did one side and i was doing the other and uh, his arms got tired and he let go which <laughs> the thing wasn't fastened down so if i went down with it on top of me and broke my leg bad timing really i think this was back at the easter holidays when i was nine years old which would have been 1955 and then i broke my leg quite badly but then the, there wasn't things while well, you still got to go to school you know me, me, there's nobody to, to take me to school really my mum had a part-time job my dad worked and things like that so 
I was actually, I think I was off school, I don't know, 11 months, something like that, and I never went to school. My mum changed her job and she was in during the day, so I just spent every day with my mum, which was lovely. But didn't do a lot for my education, because I was doing, you know, sort of alright, but when the 11 plus, as they called it then, came up, I just missed all the grounding for that, and I don't think I ever recovered from that at school, really. And I moved on to secondary school, secondary modern, as they called it then, not like it. It is now. I think you had to do a, an entrance, well, just do some sort of a test going in, just normal stuff. But I think I am dyslexic as well, so I didn't really do well at that. So I just, I, I, I was in the lower stream of sort of classes all, all the way through school, really. I think there were opportunities when I could have been moved up because I always did well in the, in the class that I was in. Not a lot to say about education, really. It was a, a Catholic school, which I didn't like. I seemed to spend too much time doing things about religion and, and God and everything else and you know for children that needed a bit more time spending with them on maths and English and things like that if you seem to spend I don't know a third of a week learning about God and learning the catechism and all that crap which are just uh, not me they seem to spend more time with the people you know that uh, were doing well in education really I don't know if it's still the same now but I left school Christmas, I think, when I was, I turned 15 in the November and I left school at Christmas. Uh, so the thing to do then was to find a job. It, it, my parents were really bothered what I did as long as I got a job. You know, I had friends from school and, and, and that. I also joined the Army Cadets, which I enjoyed. I had friends in that, they were taking engineer apprenticeships and this, that and the other. But uh, I, I managed to get myself a job working for a local man. He, he was like a blacksmith welder. Uh, he made wrought iron gates and did a lot of work for the council, sharpening tines for, for the back of the road, you know, the steam, well, the steam roller they had in Leyland, for digging the road up and things like that. General welding, we did a lot of work for the local cotton mill, we cast iron welding. There's a chap there, he was one of the partners, and he, uh, I used to get on very well with him. The other chap was always bad tempered. Rex Campbell, he was called the chap, and he spent a lot of time with me, taught me a lot. Big strong man, but very gentle in some ways, and he he was a good teacher, so I appreciated all that. He ended up running a massive engineering company of his own. But the other chap was a bit, I think he had a drink problem, so he stopped working, so looking for another job, and I think by that time, <laughs> I'd managed uh, I managed to get my own motorcycle. Well, my brother had a, a, a scooter, and he, he went off to join the army, so I actually learned to ride well enough to pass my test on a scooter. I think I was 16 and a month old and I passed my bike test. But I'd already got a 350 AGS which I was doing up. I just parked the scooter up and, and rode my 350 really, which was all right. A lot of fun uh, motorcycling because I'd been fiddling with bikes all my life really, just learning and watching and then from being about 14 on, I'd, I'd repair bikes, I'd fix bikes for my dad's friends and I once remember my dad messing with the gearbox on a bike for, I don't know, about two weeks, couldn't fix it. He just couldn't get the selectors working. And losing his temper with it, and my Uncle Dick come down and he couldn't do it. But anyway, one day when I come home from school, I thought I'm going to fix that bloody thing. And my dad didn't get home from work. He worked six to six at the rubber works. So when he got home from work, I'd fixed it. So it's, uh, yeah, that was a good do. And I just did that. And So your next few jobs, what did you carry on doing? Well, yeah, my next few jobs, I, learned, I worked. I did work at the local bleach works for a while, just between jobs while we were trying to get something sorted out. But unfortunately, well, when I worked there, I had a, a, a really serious motorcycle accident on the road. I think I was only, I was, it was 1964 and it was September. So I was 17, I just had this horrendous crash. I'd been, uh, I'd been to see, a, it was quite funny really, because I'd been to see a friend and he wanted me to go and fix the timing on his bike. So and it was a place called Exton, I don't know, about eight mile away from where I lived. So I went there and when I got there he wasn't in and his, his mum said, oh he's gone out with his dad and this and that. So I didn't end up spending the afternoon there, I set off back and on the way back it was drizzling and raining. And I went round this particular bend, you know, I can see it now up in Leyland. Uh, just by, by the market store where I brought my leg, to be honest. But, uh, and I just went into this sort of right-left 
sort of rest bends in the town, not going particularly fast or anything because the road was damp. But as I got in vision going around the corner, there was a, a single decker bus sort of halfway across the road who was avoiding something. Anyway, I just tried to move the bike to the left, lost the front end and ended up under the bus. And the, the bloody thing actually ran over me. To, I ended up in uh, Preston Hospital, the Royal Infirmary as they called it then. And I didn't come out of there for nearly eight months. But I was lucky to survive really because uh, I actually, being a Catholic and my mum and dad and stuff, I actually had the last rites twice, but uh, I don't know how many operations I think I'd uh, I smashed my pelvis to pieces and ruptured my bladder and uh, I think I had about 28 broken bones and all sorts of problems and I lost a big lump of flesh off my bum which it took them six months to skin graft a little patch at a time. So that, that wasn't a good time and again uh, I was just missing out on, on education. Uh, when I got back home I didn't work for a while but uh, my father's uncle who was my great uncle Joe who, when I was sort of convalescing, he was retired and I did spend a lot of time with him and uh, a, won a wonderful, a wonderful man, uh, married and he lost his wife and he never had any children and I don't know, he looked after his niece, grand nieces and nephews, I suppose, and my dad who was his nephew and that and he, uh, I didn't know at the time but when I talked to him about what he did he, he started off with Henry Spurrier doing uh, with Leyland Motors in, in Leyland and he worked right through and before he retired he ended up he was superintendent of, uh, of a whole factory he, when I was ready for work he said Fred he said I want you to go to the motors what you go to motors and I said well what am I going to do he said well just go he said you know where the main offices were on, on Golden House, he, uh, he said, you just need to go there and, uh, and just go in there and see him. On the Monday morning I had to nip down to Mortis. So I just went down into the, into sort of the, the recruitment place and, and there was this woman in reception and she said, uh, can I help you? you know, and I said, yeah, I'm Fred Wormsley, I've come to see about a job. And she said, oh, that's unusual, have you filled any forms? And I said, no, I've not done anything. And she said, uh, oh. I'll get somebody, and so somebody comes out, and he said, what's your name? I said, Fred Wormsley. He said, are you related to Joe Wormsley? I said, yeah, he's my great uncle. Yeah, I just said, yes, he's, he's, uh, he's my great uncle. And uh, the chap said, oh, all right. He said, uh, well, you've got a job. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I just said, well, what am I going to do? And he said, oh, I don't know. I said, what do you want to do? So I just said, I said, uh, what I've done with, you know, with blacksmith and welding, fixing bikes, fixing my dad's car and stuff like that. And uh, oh, I said, well, uh, we'll put you into apprentice scheme. And he said, you're a bit late going into it, but we can put you into it. So I said, oh, well, that'll do. So I worked at Leyland's then. Thank you to my Uncle Joe. And I did that, and I did, I did, I did well there, you know, because I just had this natural ability. No, I mean, I, I've always been pretty good at maths, to be honest. I can't spell; never have been able to spell. Didn't matter later in life because I had a BA for about thirty years, so I didn't need to spell or write anything anyway. Uh, yeah, Leather Mortis were good. They certainly looked after their apprentices, and they had a, they had this uh, apprentice school that they didn't. You didn't go up to college; they had their own in-house apprentice school. You know, all the apprentices called it the pen, which was like the penitentiary, because you had to go in there and do. And they just dotted you around different sort of types of engineering, the turning, the fitting, the building engines, the R and D, different things. You know what, what you know, what, and what you'd like to do, or what they thought you were better at. That's what you you sort of you ended up doing. But it, I sort of had freelance at it because I was pretty good at doing all of it. So I did my apprenticeship and then it, it sort of come to a, you know, I, I didn't like, oh, they wanted me to work nights. So I didn't like working nights, I hated it. Uh, I just wanted to get out in the world. At, at that time, I mean, I, I got another motorbike. 
uh, much to everybody's surprise, but I think it, it wasn't the motorbike's fault I fell off it. it you know, and it, I don't suppose it was my fault, it was just the situation. In them days, uh, you know, the, the wages weren't much as an apprentice and stuff. And you, you know, I, I always, I was always brought up. I always used to tell me, they'd pay you every week in cash, in a little packet, and you could, in the corner of the packet, there was all punched into it, and a bit you could turn up so you could count the money, and, and do, make sure it was all there before you actually opened the packet, because if you'd opened the packet, said it would, you'd been paid short, but they wouldn't listen to you, so you could actually check the contents. So, but I always used to, the way I was brought up, I always went home and I'd give my mum my pay packet unopened uh, and my mum would give me some spending money back and, that, and that's just how we lived, I mean, it, it helped, you know, the family a, a little bit. I'd always have enough, I was always bothered about, it was enough for, to, to pay for my bike, I bought it off the bike I had at the time. There was a local motorcycle shop in Leyland, I mean, every sort of town then in the 60s at a local motorbike shop and the chap that ran that was a chap called Bob Burton and my dad had bought bikes off him, my older brother had and, and I just followed the trend and went to buy, buy a bike off him. I'd get a really good bike for 20 quid but I didn't have 20 quid so you know it just gave me a little book and said just come in and pay me a pound a week Fred and that's what I did. You know I can see it now this little book and when I got down the 20 quid a bit you know, if I wanted some Hollywood guards and bits and pieces for me back, I'd say, uh, Bob, can I have some of these? He said, yeah, I'll put it in your book. And, and so it went on and sometimes, you know, it, uh, I always went in and I always paid it. And uh, again, that's the way I was brought up and that's what I did. But we had uh, rockers or whatever you might want to call them. It was uh, the lo a local coffee bar. So everybody used to go down to the coffee bar at night in Leyland, it was a good coffee bar in Leyland and lads used to come from Preston, from Blackburn and Southport and quite a few places they'd just have a ride there but there was three or four coffee bars local so I just used to frequent this one in Leyland and, and they got to know a lot, a lot of lads, lots of people. In fact uh, I started seeing my first wife uh, <laughs> from in Leyland because I already knew her, she was younger than me but she went to the same school but I was friendly with her, her brother who was like me, a mechanic, whatever, and uh, and also a, a big love of motorcycles. So I used to see him in the coffee bar. It was like called Ian Govan and he lived in Preston. And he, he worked for Pickford's Heavy Haulage at Walton Liddell. And, uh, and he used to tell me about his job and this and that, working on trucks and these massive trucks and the stuff they did. And I thought, I wouldn't mind a bit of a doing that myself. Uh, to save the mundane stuff in work at half past seven in the morning and same job and this that and other. He just said one night, he said, they're looking for a fitter. I'll put your name up before. I said, yeah, do. Yeah, do that. Ian. So anyway, I ended up going to Pickford's and I got a job. Just a, a whole variety of different things. And again, I seem to have been lucky. There was a, a chap there that had been working on wagons all his working life, a chap called Cliff. And he, he was like the workshop manager, engineer. And, uh, and I learned a hell of a lot from him. And because I'd always done welding and stuff like that, they were always welding to do on, on heavy haulage. And we used to, they had gangs that moved uh, steam engines and great big presses and great big machinery from the printing works around the corner. So we quite often to adapt a trailer of weld bits on it and make skids and stuff like that for, for like the, the heavy gang, as we called them, for loading trailers and moving stuff about. There was only uh, four of us in, in the workshop, he was the boss and there was myself and Ian and another chap called Harry and uh, we had a, a nice mill machine and, and a, a good big centre lane and stuff like that. So again it was just like general maintenance but you can learn such a lot and there were drivers there that had been driving heavy haulage all their life and they would uh, sometimes when they needed what they called a third man with a load because it, it, uh, it was too big, too heavy or too wide for the driver and his mate. So they used to borrow us out to the workshop sometimes. So you get a, a run out to Liverpool docks and pick up a bloody a great big steam engine or something to deliver a steam engine. And it, it was good there at Pickford. Because it was halfway between uh, Glasgow and London and, uh, and there was no motorways. They might have, oh, the Preston bypass, but that's it. So they used to, uh, we got a lot of the 
Scotch drivers of wagons coming in, packing up overnight and then going to local. You know, they weren't being bees even, they were just designated places, houses that had been converted just for wagon drivers to stay in overnight because there were no sleeper cabs and stuff on the trucks and stuff then. You know, and they used to come and after work and drag you to the pub with, you know, apprentices, they seemed to spoil apprentices a little bit. I remember one, one of them one night, they got us, uh, they did a bit too much to drink and they took us back and it was lunchtime, they took us back and uh, me and Ian, they put a sling round us and hoisted us up with the crane and left us there all afternoon. And, <laughs> It come down to that, health and safety beyond to them, but just stuff like that, good life, enjoyed it. There was a chap that used to come in there, he, he ran this big tyre company and they needed a fitter and this and that, and, and he just said to me one day, what, what you on, how much you want? I said, and I can't remember what it was, but I told him, oh, I said, I can increase that for you a bit, come and work for me. Going to work was all about money, so I left Bickfords and went to work for them. Did a job there and I just kept moving up for more money, really. And I ended up working for a company in Leyland, which again, from where I served my apprenticeship on, they had a fleet of buses, you know, 30 odd buses, 20 coaches. I ended up just work, working in the garage there. They wanted somebody, the advert, they wanted somebody who was good with uh, automatic transmissions, because a lot of the buses had were pneumocyclic gearboxes. Well, I went to get the job and I, I told them a bit of a fib that I'd, I'd done a big course on pneumocyclics and I got the job anyway, so. And my first bloody job was to do this pneumocyclic gearbox. So, but they had, fortunately, they had a workshop manual for him. And I had a, a, this old labourer, we called him Yorkshire, because Yorkie, because he was a Yorkshireman. And I, I don't even, can't even remember his proper name. And he said, how long will it take you to do this? I said, I don't know, Yorkie, I've never done one before. And uh, took the workshop manual home with me and read it and this and that. Yeah, we managed to do it and it were all right. So, again, there's another man there called John Cross who probably, he'd, he'd been all through the war with a squadron of Spitfires and Mosquitoes, worked on Merlin's as air crew fitter and that, and just a wonderful, wonderful man. Again, married, no children. When I started to work there, people said, oh, you, you won't last long here, you never, people never last long working with him, he's such a funny bugger and this and that. But I got on with him really well and we had, we had I don't know what about, I don't know, four happy years or more working with John Cross and he taught me a lot about life and, uh, and about the job that I was doing. still do things now that Crossy taught me. Again, I left that for money, <laughs> which, you, which you do, you know. I said, I've got, I don't you might call it head-hunting now in a small way, but people that sort of took a liking to me or whatever and wanted to employ me, I just offered me more money and that's where I went, because that's what I went to work for. So there we are, that's, uh, <laughs> that brings us to a stage really where, uh, I mean, when all this was going on, uh, I was going out with the last two I ended up marrying. She was working at, a, at the one and only first ever Kentucky Fried Chicken store in England, which was in 92 Fishergate, Preston. Uh, and her mother was the manageress, and they were working for a chap called Ray Allen, who was a bit of an entrepreneur really. He, he had Wimpy Bars and Allen's restaurants, but he, he was the man that went to uh, to America to see Colonel Sanders, who really did exist. And he did some deal where he bought the rights off him for, I think it was for Europe and Great Britain, the United Kingdom, for Kentucky Fried Chicken to, to sort of establish the business in, in England. And he, he was the boss. He, he had the Wimper Bar next door, because the shop's open at night. They short of somebody to cook the chicken, so... They just said, how do you fancy, you know, at night, come up and cook the chicken? So that's what I did, which again was extra money because I didn't pack in my day job. I mean, people mourn a bit now, they work this and work that. I mean, I was always at work for half past seven in the morning and I quite often, I'd just get home, not even have any tea, but get changed and, and out to the KFC store. Sometimes I just went there and, and got changed and got washed and I just carried on working there and then I'd be motorbike, I'd run around on my bike and be back in, in the back of uh, of the shop. I still walk past that shop today and uh, and I could just look at the spot where I used to park my motorbike. Again, I blossomed at that and understanding all, all the procedures and, and this and that and some, you know, repairing the cookers and doing different things. I just blossomed at it because I was always pretty good at maths. So I ended up sort of running that business. 
and then got offered uh, another shop that was on Preston New Road at Mellorbrook and I went to open that in 1968 and that but I still carried on with my job and I was working at night but still doing all the engineering so but it, it just slowly came into it that I ended up doing that for blooming I don't know 20 or 30 years I did very well out of it and then by that time my son Matthew had been born so two children my first daughter, Carol, was born while I worked at Fishwicks. I had a little boy called Jack. And the downside of it, I missed, I missed my children. It had been for 10 in the morning or earlier. But they didn't show up by the midnight or later. Mainly midnight, but like Friday, Saturday nights. Lots of problems with, with staffing. You know, your staff make you break you. You know, you get some good stuff. There's good food and, and cash. Biggest jobs were watching for everybody fiddling, taking chicken home, giving it to their friends, you know, and taking money as well. So you need to be really careful. So uh, the only time I saw Carol and Matthew, I, used to, I took them to school in the morning. I used to get up and have my breakfast, take children to school and go to work. And it was seven days a week. You know. I mean, don't get me wrong, I did see them during the day sometimes, but not all the time. The perks from it was... Uh, you know, we could eat plenty of chicken. <laughs> we don't. I think we lived off KFC for years, still do like it. But, uh, and, and just the money, it just released things. And, you know, we could uh, never been able to afford a decent car, could buy a new car, stuff like that, and, uh, and get a decent mortgage and buy a nice house. And, you know, I, I did well at that, buying houses and getting them done up and selling them. Made quite a lot of money at that own private money, but it just at the time when properties were, were going silly. just happened, you know, I remember once I went I went to buy a house and this chap said, uh, do you need a mortgage? I said, oh, I'll need a mortgage. And he was, he had this uh, sort of agency for a building society and he was in an accountant's firm as well. And uh, he said, how much mortgage do you need? I said about 120 grand. I think this, this house for about 150 grand. <laughs> He said, you won't get a mortgage for that. I said, I can't do that. You know, you, you're wasting me time. I said, well, I said, I like the house. I'll go and see if I can get a mortgage. Anyway, uh, a good friend of mine, financial controller for Mitsubishi. And I, I just said to him, Adrian, I could do your mortgage. And, and he said, how much? And I said, about 120 grand. He said, bloody hell. So he said, I'll give you this contact. So I contacted this chap who was in London. Can't remember his name now. But anyway, I got the mortgage. And just at the time when things had gone up and I sold it for 300 grand, you know. So and then my next house, same again, really. Just buying and selling property as well as the business. We, oh, we did all right, yeah. What made you leave KFC? Well, I didn't leave KFC. <laughs> That's another story, isn't it? That's a big story, that. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the shops were doing well, doing really well. And Carol and Matt had grown up. Carol, her mother, the KFC business funded a, a flower shop for her because she always wanted a flower shop. She never had much to do with the KFC business, you know, and, and, I, and I'd got to the stage. I had a, a girl that worked for me called Janice McNally, uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful person. She came for a job uh, at Blackburn Shop and she came for a cleaner's job. And I, I interviewed her and I gave her the job. And she, when she came, she had two little girls with her. and. She started work as the cleaner and then the cookers wanted cleaning up. She didn't just clean round and mop the floors and that. The, the filters on the cookers wanted cleaning and, and I said, do you, you know, do you want a few more hours? Yeah, yes, please, yeah, yeah. So I showed her how to clean all the filters on the cookers so when the staff come in to open the shop, it was already done and cleaned down, you know, which was good really. Ended up doing an odd shift in the shop, cooking and this and that. And I just off one day, I said, Janice, I said, you should really be running this shop, you know. I think I think you need to be the manager because the manager I'd had at the time had bloody sacked to someone. They'd been fiddling or doing something anyway. And she said, "I can't do that." I said, "Of course you can do it." I said, "She said I won't be able to do it." I said, "I'll show you, Janice, how to do it. You can do it." So anyway, she she ended up running that shop, Janice. But then, you know, we had another shop in Warrington at the time, and I said, "I know I want you to train somebody to run Blackburn. How you run it, Janice?" And there's another manager at Warrington and I want you to go to Warrington on a daily basis and do that. She said, I can't drive. I said, oh, well, I'm going to book you some tests, some lessons, a bachelor lessons, and you'll have a driving lesson every day and book your test. She said, I can't drive. She said, 
My husband said, I'll never be able to drive. And I said, Johnny, so I think you can drive. So anyway, I don't know, I had a book to these tests and she had them and, and I'd bought her a little car, a new car, and she passed the test. And she just blossomed and she, she ended up doing really what I did. So it gave me a lot more to release a lot of time. But all the time I'd still be messing with motorbikes and this, that and the other. Bought a 500 Manx in the eight, early 80s, which I rebuilt and I did a bit of racing on it. Pretty good at racing, really, in the classic club. But again, the, the business thing, because I was keen on in the business and the business sold the banks quite a bit of money, they said to me that you, because you're the key man for the insurance for the business, uh, it will affect your status if you keep racing. So I had to stop bike racing, uh, much to my disappointment. Because I've done well with my bike and building engines, I've always built engines and be good at doing it. I just decided I'd build some race bikes and put other people on them to keep me involved in racing and enjoy it. That was a big hobby that still remains today, as you can see where I'm sat. I was doing that between building a really nice big massive house in, in Waddington, near Clitheroe, which uh, I've not lived there for about nearly 30 years now, but I took I don't know, 18 months out, employ a team and buy and build this house. I'm thinking, a Burnley football player lives in it now, I think he bought it for about three million quid. So anyway, that did that. I don't know, we'd, yeah, we've been pretty successful, but, but all this time, which I haven't mentioned, uh, when I was 36, I started with rheumatoid arthritis, and I really wasn't good, I, wasn't, I suffered for a long time with it, and I was still suffering with it then. Uh, so <clears throat> I wasn't doing a lot. Uh, it was quite severe at that time, so and I uh, I spent lots of time at home, and <laughs> we had a, a young lady come to work for us called Jacqueline Sturzik, who looked after Jack and uh, around the house, so it, <laughs> it meant that I was knocking about a lot. But I, I really I, I wasn't well, and I, I just took it that uh, that was it. Uh, I lived where I lived. I was still having a good income because by then computers had come in, and so the KFC side was still making a lot of money and running all right. So I was just stuck at home, a bit of pottery in my workshop. I had a workshop, I built a work, special workshop, similar to this size-wise. And in fact, the lathe behind me, that I bought it new to put in that workshop. Build these bikes and just, just do what I could, really. And Jack used to come and looking after Jack. And, and she, she just, she, she looked after me, really, because I had difficulty moving about at the time and stuff. I just felt quite happy when Jacqueline was knocking around the house and just me and her and stuff. Just one day she was, I think, I don't know, she was reading a story or something like that and, and I just smiled at her and she smiled back and I just said to her, I could fall in love with you. <laughs> and she just smiled back at me and, and that was it really as far as I was concerned, I just said that to her. And the day after she came to work and, and she just, she came in there and said, uh, I think she kissed me on my cheek and said, uh, I'm in love with you anyway or something. I just decided in my head that I didn't care what it cost me to be happy. I'd had, you know, all the luxuries in life and the lifestyle and this, that and the other. And I just thought, I'm going. We got married in with Jacqueline. Bought this place where we live now that we've lived in for nearly 25 years. And life has been excellent really. And it was all severe and tragic at the time, but it's worked out all right in the end. I had to work at it. And a marvellous 25 years really. Two lovely daughters, Katie and Lucia, who we've adopted. And we've just had a good time. I've not, I sold the KFC business back to KFC GB. I, I built it up a bit and uh, I've got it on its feet again and sold it. So really since then I've, I've just been home all the time in this house with Jacqueline. I wouldn't say you've quite been at home. <laughs> you've travelled the world. No, no we have, but I've been. <laughs> I've, I've been at home, you know, this has been the base. So I want to know how you started racing bikes with Barashim. Mm. How did you get to that point from just racing a little bit? To... We bought this house, Jacqueline and me. It's a nice big house and we've got we're family, we've got everything. All, all the time I've been, uh, I was getting quite a name really for building classic British racing motorcycles. 
the, the Manx Nortons had always been there and stuff like that. But there's a, a chap called Colin Seely in the 60s built a, a thing to try and beat the invasion of the Italian bikes and, and the, uh, the, the, you know, the Japanese invasion, the Hondas and the Yamahas and the racing bikes. Colin used a thing called a matchless a matchless G50. He used the engine from that, made his own lightweight chassis. But that had, it was defunct by then, by this time. This was mid 80s, I think. Reproduction parts were already being made for Manx Nortons, but there wasn't really anybody, anything for a, a matchless engine. Because my dad always had matchless bikes, so I always had this infinity with, with matchless, I, I like matchless bikes. And the G50 engine and the AGS 7 now, which were the 350 and the 500. I always thought of myself from an engineer's point of view and a tuner's point of view that they were the nicest engine. There was a chap uh, who lived in uh, Nuneaton that way down near Mallory Park, a chap called Mick Tabra, and he was a butcher but he had the same love of the matchless engine and because he was in sort of east of Birmingham and, and big powerhouse for engineering and, and he used to get bits made and spurs and stuff but he, he never had enough to build a complete engine. I had some bits made locally and bought some bits off making some second hand bits. And I built this, uh, the first ever replica G50 engine ever to run. And, uh, and, I, and there was another chap called Roger Titchmarsh. Uh, by this time he was making replica Sealy frames. Well he'd started doing it, so the first frame he ever made was for himself. Then the second frame he ever made, I bought off him to put this engine in. I ended up, I built the first replica Sealy matchless ever really, sometime in the in the 80s and uh, we were quite successful with that. There's a local lad called uh, Phil Nichols, good rider Phil, still see him today and we decided we'd have a go at the Classic Manx Grand Prix. We got this bike running and it, it was like a Wormsley bike, some Tabra engines and a Titchmarsh frame so I called it a wall tab tit. G50, which was quite funny at the time, but anyway, we went off to the Alaman. I'd already been going to the Alaman as a spectator and helping people with bikes, racing engines and stuff like that. So I had a good understanding of the place. And one of Nichols's friends was my first brother-in-law, which was Tony Scott. So Tony come with us and he started, he was doing a bit of bike tuning by then, mainly two strokes. But we just went as a group of lads, just stopped in a hotel to run this bike. We did all right in practice and Phil were getting used to it. You know, race day come and Phil had done quite well in practice and this and that. And I always remember Scotty used to used to wind Nichols up all the time and he, Scotty said to him, I think he was just getting ready to put his crash helmet on to go out and Scotty said, Nichols! And Phil said, what's up? He said, if you don't win this fucking race, don't come <laughs> don't stop when you come through pit stop last lap. Just ride it down to the docks, get off it, get on a boat and fuck off. You know, and the Nichols would get all worked up and jittery and that. We were all just having a laugh, you know. But anyway, he went out we ended up winning the bloody race, didn't we? So that, that with that, as you might say, I mean, we had a, a prolific piss up, I can tell you anyway. It cost quite a bit of money. But yeah, we had a good day and we won that race. So it got, got us a bit of a reputation. I'd already I'd met another chap called... Uh, Bill Swaller had met him when we were running a bike at a short circuit at Aberdeer, I think. Bill was a fantastic, tremendous rider. And I, I didn't really know him well enough to talk to, but as I was coming out of the pits, Bill was sat on the wall at the end of the pits looking all forlorn and pissed off. And I said, what's up, Bill? And he said, oh, the bloody thing were going all right, but this happened and that happened and this and that. And I had a lot of faith in Bill, and I still have. We're, we're like blood brothers, really. He thinks I'm his dad, but I'm not. <laughs> he's nearly the same age as me but anyway you know I just said to Bill again just one of them moments I said Bill I said do you want a proper bike for next year he said I'd love one I said well I'll bloody build you one I never spoke to him again and then you know the, the year after I was talking to his brother and he said and he said have you built this bloody bike for our Bill to have a ride on and I said yeah, yeah I have actually he said well when are you going to contact him I said I don't know how to contact him so I got back in touch with Bill and Bill rode it did well on short circuits took it to the Manx Grand Prix and, uh, and won again the year after Bill won on my bike the year after lapped it about 103 on a 500 British single which was pretty tremendous then in the 80s because the roads weren't very good not like they are today I don't know it just led on to uh, Two other things, and then the, another chap that had been a TT rider got interested in a chap called Bob Heath. He, he did 
Le Mans Grand Prix when Bill won, but he, he borrowed an old bike off somebody and it didn't work very well and this and that, but he had a friend who, who's still my friend today, a chap called Tom Dickey. Tom had won the Manx in 1966, I remember him winning it on a Coles matchless. Bob Ace had this tuner called Bob Newby who did his engines, but they were all right, they were reliable, but they didn't just have that last little bit of speed. So Tom Dickey said to him, Bob, he said, you want to get Fred to do your engines? And so Bob Ace being a bit of a, he used to be indecisive, but he wasn't very sure. You know, it was a bit hard work. So he asked me to build him an engine, which I did. But he still kept the other man, uh, Bob Newby, in case my engine didn't work. So anyway, by this time, in the old man, Tom Dickey lived at a farmhouse out overlooking Castletown. So we stayed there. I did this engine for him. Anyway, he went out and practised on it. On the, the first night, Saturday night, I practised. The Bob Newby engine, we took it out of his bike and put my engine in. I said to him, I said, Bob, this engine, I said, there's quite a bit of new stuff in it. I've done a cam for it and I've done this and that. And I said, so first lap, just, you know, just run it. But don't, you know, don't go for a really, really quick lap. Just settle it in. Anyway, an average lap then, I don't know, we're about, well, a really fast lap, we're about 103 and a bit. Anyway, Bob just leisurely set off on this bike and he, he come through pits at the end of first lap. We weren't even expecting him. And he come whistling through and he'd lapped about 104 from standing stair. So then he's flying up in practice. He come whistling in and anyway, he ended up, he did, uh, I can remember the times now, he did 21.18.8, which was 106.22, which smashed the, the lap record. He come up the pit lane and he, he got off the bike, took his helmet off, said, bloody old Fred, he said, he's fast this thing. There were people coming round because it was on loudspeaker, what speed he had done. And... Uh, he, he did that, but the thing was that Bob Newby, the other tuner, was in the Isle of Man and he was knocking about with his chest stuck out, thinking his engine had just done what my engine had done. Ethy had the horror, well, it, weren't, it was his own fault really, he should have gone and told him. It wasn't his engine he was using, it was mine. And uh, it was quite funny really. But anyway, it, we all went back and again, you know, me and Tom had a bit of a party. Bob was miserable, they wouldn't have a drink. So we were having with tea because Bridget, Tom's wife, had made us a good spread and that. And so we were having a meal. And I said to Bob, I said, when are you going to pay me for this bloody engine? I said, because if, if you don't want to pay me, I'll take it out tomorrow, which was Sunday. I'll take it up the pits. I'll be able to sell it at a profit, you know, which what you've just made it do. <laughs> Before he got his pudding, he went upstairs, come back and gave me a cheque for engine. So he decided he were keeping it. I don't know, between them, with Bill and Bob and... We seven hours and uh, we, we did the first 100 mile an hour we're lap with a, a British 350 single. Bob did that with the seven hour. Again, it was my engine, I built it for him, he ended up buying it off me. But I think between them, probably, uh, we won about 15 Classic Mines Grand Prix. I mean, today, now, my bikes and engines, before the TT lock changed the Classic Mines Grand Prix, I think, we'd, I can't remember exactly, but about 28 classic Max Grand Prix, 350 and 500, which is pretty, it's unbeatable. Nobody in the world will ever beat that. Towards the end of the time with Bob Heath racing, he, <laughs> he used to bring uh, Barry Sheen's father with him, Franco. Well, I, I knew Barry a bit to nod to, but I didn't know him. But I knew Franco, because Franco used to come racing with Bob Heath and me, Tom Dickey. You know, but he, he used to come to short circuits as well. The job progressed and Andy Molly wanted to go to the Alamont to, to race bikes and stuff like that. He had trouble with the engines and that. I hadn't built them, but he had trouble with them. So I was just helping him a bit. By that time, uh, Jacqueline and myself, had, uh, we'd got Katie, and Katie was within the Alamont, just a baby in arms. And we stayed at a woman's house. She was a single woman called Stephanie. And we stayed there, and uh, I'm working in, on bikes in the garage, she had a nice garage and a big view. And she just come out and said, Steph, she said, Fred, I said, what, Steph? She said, Barry Shane's on phone for you. I said, piss off. No, she said, he is, he's on phone for you. You know, so she said, come in and talk to him. So I went in and he said, all right, Fred, it's Barry. I said, no, oh, Barry, what can I do for you? And he, he said, I want you to come to Goodwood Revival, Fred, and bring a bike for my mate Damon. And I said, Damon who? He said, Damon Hill. Ah, I said, well, What's the crack then? He said, well, just bring one of your bikes for him to ride. He said, I'm already riding there, but will you do it? And I said, yeah, I'll do it, Barry. Yeah, great. Right, I said, I'll, I'll see you at Goodwood. He said, they'll be getting in touch with you, sending you all details and this, that and the other. So 
asked if I could go pre, sorted out. I had a, a Norton that I'd been running. So I took that to, to Goodwood. We all went. <laughs> Jacqueline came, Katie came in a little pram, <laughs> a big pram. We, we borrowed a, a 50s pram off somebody for it to go to because of Goodwood Revival. When, when we got there, we went into the pits and this and that. And Barry just turned up, you know, like we were long lost bodies, really. We just, it took an instant light to me and, and I took an instant light to him and we, we really, we were on the same hymn sheet, we really got on very well. Come time to practice on the bikes, and, and Barry went out to practice on this bike and it, it belonged to a chap called Ian Telfer, the, the biking lot, we called him Grandma, he was like an older statesman, good engineer, he was chief engineer for British Rail for a long time or something, but uh, Barry went on his bike and Damon Hill went on my bike. On the uh, first lap of practice, Barry went out on his bike and the back wheel spindle started to come out and he just avoided like crashing in. Could have been hurt quite badly really. And Damon Hill was going round on my bike. Hill should have been through now. Where's he, where's he, where is he? Has he fallen off? Has he broke down or what? But then I said, no, that's my bike coming and my bike come past and Barry Sheen was riding it. I thought, what's going on here? Anyway, a few more laps and Barry Sheen kept coming round and then practice finished. A Barry Sheen came in riding my bike with Damon Hill sat on the bloody back of it. He said, what's going on? Oh, he said, that fucking thing I'm riding, bloody back wheel spin will come out nearly had me off. He said, so I had to get a bit of practice in, so I waved Damon down to have a ride on your bike. And he, he just put his arm around me and smiled at me. He said, fucking hell, Fred, that bike's quick. So he said, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. He said, I don't want to ride that other fucking thing. I want to ride your bike. I said, well... I said, I, I said, bike's there, Barry, you, you ride it if you want it. I said, there's nothing else I can say. But he, the chap who won the other bike was an old friend of his dad, Sam Telfer, and, and that very, you know, thoughtful and that. He didn't want to upset him. And he said, he said, I won't be able to do it at the moment, Fred. He said, but he said, I'm not going to ride that other bike until you've been right through it. He said, he said, I don't trust it. <clears throat> I mean, unbeknown to me at the time when Frank or Barry's dad came racing with us and that, he used to go back and chat to Barry and tell him about me and my bikes and stuff, you know. So Barry, he knew a lot more about me than what I, I knew, he knew. I went right through Telfer's bike and he went out and I, I don't know if he won. I don't know if he won the first sat, the Saturday race, but on on the Sunday, it was absolutely, it was bloody, Damon Hill rode my bike and I think he finished about third on the Saturday or something. But he, he wasn't putting his best into it because he was still under contract and hadn't finished the Formula 1 Grand Prix so he was still under contract that if he crashed and he wasn't able to do the last Formula 1 it would have cost him a fortune so he, you know, he was a bit tongue in cheek, he was being careful. So he came, he was absolutely pouring down on the Sunday and a Damon Hill come round in a car and said Fred, he said I can't ride your bike today, he said I cannot risk riding it. So I parked the bike up and Martin Ogborn, a friend of Barry's who would work for, with him at Suzuki, he was helping Barry, so I just decided to help Barry. And uh, anyway, we set his bike up and that. I think we changed the engine overnight, we'd done something. And, uh, and he, uh, he, Barry won that race. So when he won it, I mean, after everything had settled down, we were in the pits and, and Barry just come round and said, thanks Fred, thanks for all your help and that, and for helping Damon out. And, uh, and by the way, he said, I'll be doing this next year, but I, he said, he said, I'm never ever going to ride another classic bike unless it's yours. And that's what he did. He, uh, he went back off to Australia, sort of kept in touch. Barry decided that he, he wanted to ride my bikes. So just at that time, there was another championship it was run by a chap called George Beale, and it was called Inca, International Classic Association or something. And it, they were, we were racing all over Europe and England, and uh, I had two Nortons, a good rider from Rosendale, from not far from where I was born, uh, called John Cronshaw. John had started riding my bike in the Inca Championship, but he also had a, a gold star as well that he rode himself. And a good, good bike builder, good tuner, John. So John was, was doing that. So we, we were doing this Inca Championship as well. Barry sort of fancied doing a bit of that. And he was doing a lot of commentary in, on bike racing and car racing and everything in Australia. And the Grand Prix in, in Europe. Uh, yeah, round about this time, Barry had decided he was just going to ride my bikes. We kept in touch. We, he actually, Barry rang me nearly every day. 
about 10 o'clock in the morning for a drink and it'd be very sure he just chats in what you're up to what you're doing sort of thing but anyway he wanted uh, I think he wanted to do a bit more he wanted to do some classic racing so but he had friends in Australia who, who had helped him restore some of his works bikes from when he was a Suzuki works rider who also had a mattress G50 and, and Barry wanted to uh, to have a go at classic racing in Australia I think they it was pretty strong then, the classic movement in Australia. So what he did, he, he organised uh, some sponsorship he, because he was, I mean, he was the highest paid person on Australian television at the time because he, he did all the commentaries and different stuff. And so anyway, he organised uh, for some sponsorship to fly a bike out to Australia and to fly uh, me and Jacqueline and baby Katie to Australia as well. It was really good because, I mean, Barry was like, for us, he was like Mr. Fix It. Anyway, what, what we did, he arranged for us to go and we flew. We actually flew into a place called Coolangatta, which is just up the road from where Barry lived. So we, we went there, did we? We flew into Melbourne and then to where Barry lived. But then it, they just picked us up and we went to stay at Barry's house, and, which was very good because there's a swimming pool and all sorts of things. He got everything uh, for Katie. He'd, he'd got a, a cot and a a walker and all, all everything, everything we needed. He got a list of us before we went and he just rented it all. So when we got there, there was everything we needed. So it was just like home from home. In fact, Barry said, just treat it like your own home, Fred. You, you're welcome here at my house anytime you want. So, so that's what we did. So we spent some time there and then we went down to Phillip Island and the, the bike was already at Phillip Island. Barry had a friend, I can't remember his name now, but he, he ran the biggest import export company in Australia. We just took the bike there and uh, one of my Nortons, a 95 board, pretty quick bike. We got there and, and we got to do scrutineering. Their officials have to come and check the bikes and stuff like that. There was this particular uh, scrutineer because he, he said we couldn't go out because the bike hadn't been to scrutineering. And I uh, said, well, we're not bringing the bike and Barry's not coming in a queue with his leathers either. You know, you'll have to come and do it. And he said, oh, well, we can't do that. So I just said a word with the chap who won the circuit at the time. And he said, uh, oh, take an to them. He said, it's, uh, it's our circuit, our race. We'll sort him out. Anyway, scrutineers come and check the bike. And then he started giving me an hard time. There's a strict regulations on the width of your rims and all sorts of things. But this scrutineer, the cheeky bastard, he said, uh, them rims are too wide. Uh, I think you've reached Hampton. And I said, oh, piss off. I said, just gee, you, just measure them, you know. And he were messing about, and I just said to Barry, any more of this crap, that bike's going back in box, and I'm going to fuck off, so I'm not putting up with it. So Barry, again, had a word with the owner, and the owner called me and said, look Fred, it's my party, that bike is racing here, no matter what. I said, yeah, but the thing is legal, you know, it, it's riotous, and I want it to be recognised as right. So he just addressed everybody and just told them, you know, and it's, come and look at it if you don't think it's right. And, and do that anyway, so th then we really pissed him off because we went out in practice and Barry was the fastest on my bike. And that first race meeting at Philip Island, it was over a weekend, but it was very fast and he brought the lap record and that, so the Aussies were a bit pissed off at us. But anyway, that's what we did. And then we went back to uh, to, to Barry's house, but we were in, uh, in Melbourne. Oh, the Iron is a car and everything we drove about in Melbourne. And Barry, he was doing some work for the television station, which was in Melbourne. But there's a great big uh, Crown Plaza, a massive, massive place, and a hotel, like a five-star hotel on it, and uh, pretty expensive. Barry said, where are you going to stop? I said, I don't know yet, somewhere. He said, oh, come and stop at Crown Plaza. I said, you're having a laugh, Barry. How much a bloody night is that? Oh, don't worry about it, he said. He said, uh, just come in, and uh, he said, the manager's a mate of mine. So anyway, we went in, and we ended up, we had a, like a small, sweet, massive room, quite high up. And, uh, and I said, how much is this going to cost? And, and Barry said, oh, just give manager a drink, you'll be all right. So that's what I did. I don't know how much a night it was, but I don't know. We only gave him a couple of hundred Aussie dollars and he was happy and uh, so were we. So he did just another thing that Barry just sorted out. And then we, we were flying back to Barry's. We, went, we were in Melbourne Airport and I mean, it was boiling hot. I mean, then days I was pretty well, well overweight. I was, I don't know, about four stone heavier than I am at the moment. I was fat. <laughs> so, but it, there's me with Katie in a posture. I've got my belly hanging out of a pair of shorts and a t-shirt on. And 
the Jacklins were, were just sat in this cafe. And I saw a crowd turning and looking. I thought, what's going on? Anyway, Barry's walking up, so they're all looking at him. Oh, he said, there you are, Fred. He said, come on with me. And uh, I said, where are we off to? Oh, I said, you don't need to sit down here. So we went off and we went. <laughs> we ended up in the chairman's lounge, right up in the top of the airport. And we just go into the door and this quite officious looking woman looks and Barry just said, these people are with me. And we just walked straight in, we didn't, who are you, whatever, whatever. But we were in there and we had drinks and a bit of breakfast and stuff like that. And flew up to Barry's house, but again, it was uh, typical of the man. This is the, the stuff that he used to do. And then we, uh, on the way there, we'd been at Heathrow and we were looking uh, at jewellery and, and Jacqueline saw uh, a short pad watch and we really liked it, but it was about nine grand, duty free supposed to be. I think we, we just been telling Barry about it or somebody at his house one night because we just used to sit on a settee, he'd put some Chardonnay in the freezer and we'd drink bottles of wine and eat Fredo biscuits and stuff and chocolate and stuff like that because that's just what we used to do when exchanging stories and this and that. But anyway, we just said about this watch and he said, bloody hell, he said, uh, one of my mates owns most of the jewellery stores in uh, in Australia. I'll give him a ring. So he, f he phones this fella up and explains the watch and the fella rings him back and said, yeah, I've got one, Murray. It's uh, it's in the shop on the rocks in Sydney. You know, so I said, well, we were going to Sydney anyway. So I said, we'll come and look at it. Uh, Jacqueline and Katie and myself, we flew down to Sydney. We did fly down, yeah and got in this hotel and we, we, we went all over with Katie, took her to the zoo and koala bears and, and all that and uh, we went to look at this watch. Anyway, it was the right thing Jacqueline wanted. I can't, I can't remember how much it was. I think it was about four grand, I think. And so it was like, you know, a lot cheaper, five, six grand cheaper than it was at Heathrow. So we decided to, to buy that, which she still wears every day now. But there was another watch there, uh, an Amiga Moon watch that I really liked, and, I, and that again was a lot, lot cheaper than it was in England. Uh, Barry had phoned up, did you get your watch? Yeah, I said, there's another one here, Barry, but I quite like. Ask him to do us a price on it. So price come back, and it was a really good price. And, uh, and Barry said, are you getting it? I said, well, no, I said, because it's just, it'll just, the money we have available on this trip and this and that, I said, just clean us out. I said, so we need to keep some money. Oh, don't worry about that, he said. And he said, uh, just give the phone to the person. And I said, give him the phone, wrap the watch up and give it me and your mother's and Jacqueline's watch. And, uh, and that was that, you know. And, uh, and I, always, I said to him, you know, when I spoke to him later in the day, what did you pay for the watch? What do we owe you? Oh, I said, we'll make it right, Fred. Just knock, he said, I'll probably have a bike in a bit, just knock it off that. And, he, and, and that's what we did. I, did. I never actually paid for the watch, uh, but I've still got it. So, yeah, that was uh, the first trip to Australia. We had a really good time. And we, we spent, I don't know, we must have spent a week knocking about around, around Sydney and looking here and there and that, and in that uh, Queen Elizabeth Park and up the river and all over the place. And then, anyway, it was time for us to fly home. So we got on the flight and it was changing aircrafts at Singapore. So we got off the aeroplane and then we're going to get on the next one. The other side of like a glass thing, there's another crowd of people walking and Barry was amongst them. He said, bloody hell, we didn't know you were going back to uh, to England this quick. No, neither did I. He said, some business come up, so I'm going back. But he, he was like, on, I said, probably flying first class or business class. Then uh, went upstairs where he was and we had a couple of drinks and this and that. Come back down and he disappeared again. And then, I don't know, we were over Europe somewhere and he come back. He said, Fred, come on. We went up and then them days, you know, we were in a, a jumbo, a jumbo jet. We just went up and every, you know, hostesses and stuff were smiling at Barry. Opened the door into cockpit, went, we went straight in. And the chap says, oh, Barry, sit here, Fred, you sit there. So we just sat there and we were coming over France. And we're talking to the pilot, the captain, and just asking about the aeroplane, what it's like to fly and this and that. And he said, can you see that haze, that light over there? I said, yeah, I can see that. He said, that's London. He said, them are the lights from London. It's pollution, light pollution into the sky. And I just sat there and we flew right across the channel, right up and over London. And just before it was about to land, I said to go back to my seat. So that was another treat, you know, from Barry just organising things for you. So at the same time, we were doing this European Championship and just racing, you know, the, 
there was that Inca Championship and it was a European one. But we did races uh, all over Europe, really. But I had a Ford Cargo, seven tonner, seven and a half tonner, and it was made into a bike transporter and a bit of a motor on. And we trundled all over the continent on that, Jacqueline, Katie and myself. It had a pull-out double bed, which we had, but I'd made a little bed at the bottom for baby Katie to go in. That's what we did. We wandered around Europe and winning races, and John Conshaw was riding the bike. There was a round at Donington Park in England, which was Grand Prix support. I had another rider as well as Conshaw that rode a bit more chap called Steve Tomes, and he was an exceptionally good rider. So we planned to do Donington Park with the Grand Prix and, and Barry just rang me up one day and said Fred I, I fancy doing this ink race at Donington can you do it for me? I said yeah I can do it he said right he said I don't want to go and show myself up he said how do you think I'd do against you know the European classic races he said they'd be a bit, be a bit faster than the ones in Australia and I said I think you'll be alright he said we need to be at Donington for uh, the latest on, on Friday Thursday afternoon can we do some practice? I said we could practice at Mallory on the Wednesday. Right, he said we'll do that. So I, I drove, put the bike in the van and drove to Mallory Park and I'm waiting for Barry to turn up. Anyway, all of a sudden this helicopter comes across and lands in the bottom of the paddock and Barry jumps out. He went, had a poke at the bike and this and that. He looked at me, he said, uh, he said, I can't ride that fucking thing. He said, he said, forks and suspension. He said, no, I said, I, I don't like it. I said, look, Barry. I said, it's failed the paddock test, go and have a fucking ride on it. So he looked at me and went out on it and come back and he said, he said, I can't believe that, how nice it is. He said, I just want to alter this. He always had to alter a little bit of summer. He always had the last word. And he said, I want somebody to time me. He said, I'm not going to go to Donington and not do well. He said, so if I'm not fast enough, I ain't going to ride. So, yeah, all right. So a friend of mine, she was timekeeper for uh, for the vintage club, so she, she lived quite close to Mallory, so she'd come and she put the clocks on him and he was going really fast, I mean, amazingly fast. And, and when he come in, she went to him and he said, I've done this. She said, well, you've smashed the classic lap record. He smiled at me and said, that'll do, Fred. I'll, uh, I'll see you at Donington Friday morning. So, yeah, all right, this was Wednesday afternoon. And he jumped in his helicopter and pissed off and I, I had to drive all, all, all the way back from Mallory Park up home and prep two bikes and be a at Donington for qualifying so I got there on Thursday evening. There was a race on Saturday and a race on Sunday and Steve Thomas won one and Barry won one so it, it, it was really good but both my bikes won over the weekend. That was that and then the next the next Goodwood, uh, same again, if Barry came and he actually rode my bike and he, he just blew everybody off and won it. It was obviously he wasn't really well but he, he won the races. He was obviously he was having trouble eating. He was eating soft bread and bananas, and uh, so he, he said, um, "I'll go and see a specialist when I get back." Anyway, when he got back to Australia, he'd been to see. He went to see a specialist. who was a, a friend of his as well. He was a surgeon, and he ended up with a camera down his throat and this and that. And when he woke up and come round from it, his friend was there, and he just said to him, "Fucking hell, Barry, you got cancer," you know, and, and that was. The beginning of the end really because he I think he, he didn't have any modern sort of intervention I think he'd been told that it was gone too far and he'd left it too long he, his wife had been telling him for bloody months to go and get it sorted out but he hadn't and he, he'd let it get too far I, I found out it was quite odd really uh, I was in the Isle of Man just after uh, we were at the Manx Grand Prix but this reporter just phoned me up and said, Fred, we need your comments on, the, on Barry having cancer. And I just went silent and he said, you don't know, do you? I said, no, I don't, no. So anyway, he told me and this and that. I won't make any comments because Barry had always said to me, if any reporters talk to you, Fred, about me or anything, don't tell them anything. But he, uh, I, I just rang him up and I said, Barry, there's bloody reporters ringing me up telling me you've got cancer and he said I have Fred, yeah. He said I was going to ring you but I knew you were busy racing and I was going to ring you after that. And from then on he, he spoke every day, every day he spoke to me and he, he'd just ring up at 10 in the morning, tell me how we were feeling, how we were doing and he rang me up once and he, he said I was flying back, he said Brian Adams were in the next seat and we were chatting. 
He said he was going to appear at the Opera House in Sydney and he said to Barry, come down and see us like, you know, so well, the phone rang one morning again. It's Freddie's Barry. I said, you all right? He said, yeah, I'm as good as I'm going to get. He said, I'm, I'm just on the steps going in the Opera House in Sydney. He said, Brian Adams were on flight coming back and uh, he's invited us down to, you know, to see him here and, and the show and everything else. And I said, oh, that's good. And uh, I said, bloody hell, Barry. I said, that's... Uh, favourite song that, what he sings, anything I do, I do for you. I said, we had it sung at my wedding. Ah, I said, ah, that's all right, Freddie. He said, oh, I'll have to go, we're going in. It's all right, see you. And uh, anyway, about, I don't know, an hour and a bit later, phone rings again. And, uh, and he's Barry on the phone. He said, Fred, take the phone to Jacqueline quick. So I took her the phone and there's Brian Adams singing the bloody song. Which is just... Another thing Sheeny did, he, he, loved, he loved to make people happy that, and, and he just did stuff like that and he, you know, he's uh, famous people I find a lot have this aura about them and there's always somebody happy to slag them off and this and that. But you, you never know until you really know the person, you know, exactly what they're like and uh, I mean I knew and loved Barry like a brother, you know, and that was that. But anyway, uh, we're doing this blooming European Championship with John Cronshaw. The points, it was really, really close. We got some crap fuel. We didn't finish a race proper in Osterslip. So we dropped back in points. We were leading it easy. And anyway, we had to drive to uh, Most in Czechoslovakia. So we went in seven and a half tonner. Well, we'd actually raced in Italy before that. What we did, it was John and myself. Uh, we won a race. In, in Italy on the Adriatic coast. John had ridden really, really well and, and we won that. So then we went back to some friends near Milan that John had, because John speaks fluent Italian. He, so we went back there and we left we left the van and the bikes there and we flew back home because I think it was about a fortnight before we were due to go to Czechoslovakia. So we just went, flew into Stansted, got the tube to Houston and then home. Then we went the same way back and then we got in the seven and a half tonner and set off from uh, just near Milan. And we drove up round the back of Venice and all that area. We ended up in, uh, in Most in Czechoslovakia, which is a, a long, long way. I had 295 Boy Nortons with me. They were both getting a bit tired. They'd had a you know, quite a busy season. And we were having a running problem at the time with the, with the cylinder barrels. I wanted a, a full aluminium billet ceramic plated and my supplier wouldn't do it and, uh, and so we were having trouble with barrels and we had trouble with, bo with both bikes and uh, I think we won the first race but the bike uh, it, it obviously weren't going to I think it went out in practice and broke down so then on another bike that wasn't that good so I ended up I pulled, pulled the engines in bits and made a, what I thought was a good engine out of two and, uh, and so we had this last race and John Cronshaw needed to win it. He, he had to win it because the chap that was second, he, he was only like, I, I don't know, I think he would points in front of us, so John had to win it. And John said to me, what's the chances, Fred? I said, well, John, I said, if you ride it out there and it does a warm-up lap, I said, you've a good chance of it winning. You know, I said, it should keep going. We ended up winning and we won the championship. And it was coming up to Goodwood time. I'd already prepped to G50 for Goodwood for Wayne Gardner to ride because Barry had said, I am, I'm not doing good with Fred, I'm not fit, I can't do it. You know, so I said, oh, all right, Barry, you know. And, uh, anyway, we just finished racing in Czechoslovakia, my phone rang, and it's he, Barry on his mobile, rigging me in Czechoslovakia, and said, Fred, I'm going to do Goodwood, can you do it for me? And I said, bloody hell. And I said, yeah, yeah, all right, Barry, I can do it for you. So I told John and, uh, very mind, we were in, well in, you know, far into Czechoslovakia, the bloody van that did, you know, 60 mile an hour, and uh, uphill and down Dale. So we just packed up and set off. We, we missed the party and everything, and we got cracking. I drove for four hours, John drove for four hours, then I drove two, then John did two. So we'd solid driving for 12 hours. We, we just got our head down and set off again, just kept filling it up. We had, you know, some food for sandwiches and that. Um, we, we were sailing out of Rotterdam. When we got into Holland, John's phoning up trying to get us a place on the boat. Anyway, we managed to get a place on the boat. 
Sunday afternoon we'd left Czechoslovakia and I think on Tuesday morning we were into Rotterdam. So I don't know how many miles it was but it was a lot. We got home, I dropped John off in Rottenstall at home and then I came back here and I'd got the G50, it was ready to go. So I came in, gave Jacqueline a kiss and went straight to my workshop to turn round. So on the Wednesday afternoon I set off to Goodwood. First practice, Barry went out on it. But the thing was going really quick but it nipped up and it broke down. And Wayne Gordon was out in the G50 just blowing everybody off and going very fast. So, and, and Barry looked dreadful. He, he looked so ill, you won't believe. And so anyway, I said, don't worry about it, Barry, I've got another engine. So we swapped engines and he, he went out in practice, but it, it wasn't as fast as the G50. He just uh, just said, well, we'll have to do the best we can with it. I mean, Wayne Gordon was on about the G50, can I have a new front tyre? I want to alter this, one alter that. I said, I can't do anything with it. I said, that's it, you'll have to ride it like it is. It come for the race on the Saturday and Barry finished second but only like half a wheel behind Gardner. So then they went out on the Sunday and uh, Barry won the race just enough in front of Gardner to win the whole event. It, well, when we stopped and they got the presentation and that, and fired the back up, Barry got on it and did his, his winding down lap as he always did, put his cross helmet on the tank and waved to the crowd. And he'd been signing autographs, very ill, but signing autographs all weekend. And he rode back into the park for me and sat on the bike and he just pulled me to, to him and he, he said, Fred, he said, I can't get off the bike. He said, I just, I just can't get off it. And I said, don't worry about that, Barry. We'll, uh... He said, I don't want anybody to see me struggling. I said, don't worry about it. I said, sit on it and steer it round. And my son Matthew was with me. And I said, and I said to Matt, I said, he can't get off Matt. Just push the bike and Barry round to the pits. So as soon as the open park for me, Matt sets off, rushed into our pit and, and I stood in the way and uh, one hand on the bike and, and Matthew just picked him up and lifted him off the bike. He was so knackered. I held a, a sheet up where well, Matthew got his leathers off him and got him dressed. He was just absolutely knackered. That's the last time I saw him really. He, he, uh, he embraced me and gave me a kiss on my cheek and said, thank you very much Fred, you've never let me down. I'll be in touch. And he flew off to Australia and we spoke every day until two days before he died. Which, uh, that was that. But it's the legacy not happened for a while but the legacy still goes on you know I suppose in the bike worlds I'm, I'm known as the, the man that sponsored Barry Sheen for a few years in classic racing and, and his great friend and then my great friend and I remember once I, I phoned up a supplier to open an account and uh, to buy some bike bits and stands and different stuff and, uh, and the chap I spoke to he said, he said what's your address of your business and I told him, he said, well that's your home address. I said, yeah. I said, I work from home. Oh, he said, we can't open an account for anybody that works from home. He said, we don't do it. He said, it could be anybody. So I said, look, I said, can I speak to anyone else besides you? I said, no disrespect, but can I speak to anyone else? And he said, well, you can speak to the owner if you like, but you won't get anywhere. I said, well, let me speak to him. So anyway, I spoke to the chap. He said, the business is called Bike Bit. It's good for him. Uh, and he came on and he said, are you the Wormsley that uh, sponsored Sheen here at uh, Donington? I said, yeah. He said, your account's open, what do you want? You know, which is just, it was only the association, you know, and, and it still happens sometimes, you know. And, uh, he, I got sponsorship of Cosworth because of Barry, because they wanted him to drive a salt box in bed for a race at Goodwood and just just all sorts of stuff, a bit like dropping a pebble in a pond and it's all the little ripples that come out and he, and he Barry's life and our friendship still affects my life. Uh, and I think, you know, it always will. So that was uh, the closing of that chapter really. I still keep in touch with his wife, not as much now, but certainly his daughter and his son and done things at Goodwood with him and Charles March who's the Duke of Richmond he's a friend of mine and you know we're on first names so I can ring him up anytime I want he rings me but he was a big friend of Barry's and and that you know and I know quite a lot of people because of Barry and and it's op opened a lot of doors which it does it's the old cliche it's not what you know it's who you know or, or who knows me now you know and, uh, and, and that's it so then I just uh, we carried on with the 
bike racing career and with Glen English who had already ridden bikes and we did the Inca and actually uh, won a world championship in 2003 or 2002 that was that so but as you get older you think that I've lots of other things I want to do so I bought a little Cooper racing car and I raced that and very successful with it in its own class over the last uh, I don't know about three or four years I've been messing with hot rods and American vehicles which is uh, which is all good fun you know and that brings it up to date I mean we can uh, we did a, a trip to Pendine with my daughter and her young man and we enjoyed it and we've got plans to go back this next year the job goes on like I said earlier I think I'm nearly 75 but I'm pretty fit and well so I'm just gonna carry on doing what I do so how did um, Fred Bloody Wormsley come about? Oh, Fred Bloody Wormsley, well, <laughs> that was Barry. Barry was really good at taking people's accents off. And he could talk broad Lancashire, just the same as how I talk naturally. If somebody said, can you do this? I'd say, ah, bloody hell, of course I can do it. Bloody hell, yeah, of course I can. He just said to me one day, he said, you know, you're always saying bloody hell, I. I said, yeah, of course, yeah. I said, that's, sorry, that's me. He said, no, it's all right. And, he, he, and then... He christened me FBW, Fred Bloody Wormsley, and that, whenever we spoke or he rang me up, he said, Fred Bloody Wormsley, what are you doing? You know, and stuff like that. But when he went back to Australia, uh, and he was on the telly in Australia, he kept saying it as well. And I think the whole of Channel 7 were saying, I bloody hell I, you know, and it, just a thing thing he did. And I was talking to him once, and I think it's when Damon Hill with her. And, I mean, Damon was all right, but a bit aloof and a bit. I just said to Barry one day, I said, how do you get off with Damon's wife? She's got a, she's got a face like a bloody slapped ass." And he cracked out off. He said, what the fuck did you say? And I told him again, and he turned and told his wife, and he laughed, and he said, you're bloody right there, Fred. You know, I said, well, that's just things that happen. And he's on the phone to me one night, and because he had a flat in London that he shared with somebody. And I could hear a piano playing in the background, and I, I said, who the fuck's that playing piano, Barry? Oh, I said, it's Damon, he thinks he can play a piano. And I said, tell him from me, it's a good job he can drive a car. And Barry's laughing. He said, Damon, Fred said it's a good job he can drive a car. You know, just silly little things that, that, that happened. I don't think Damon really appreciated it. And I don't know to this day if he knows I said his wife had a face like a slapped ass. But that's how she looked on the day and that's what, she, that's what I thought. So, uh, what other like celebrities have you met through, right? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, just after when Barry had died, God bless him, it was quite odd really because I had his bike here and in my study. And the chap who, well, he used to know, Peter Willoughby at the time, he was running all the race events, bike race events at Scarborough. And they always they had this Barry Sheen race. He just rang me up one day and he said, Fred, we, we want to make the Barry Sheen race, the Barry Sheen Memorial race. Will you come up and, and do some talking and do this and do that? And I said, yeah, hi, bloody hell, hi, of course I will, yeah, I'll come up. Then he said, I said, I can bring Barry's bike. I said, it's in your, oh, he said, that'll be fantastic. We can put it up on to, just outside at start, starting line. I got a trophy made, which, you know, which is Barry Shane Memorial from FBW, you know, from, from me. And so I took that up as well and they decided they still do give it out to this day. But unknown to me, Scarborough, the, the track's sort of at this level and then there's a banking. And at the top of this banking, there's a bit of a plateau and then a fence and a steep hill. So the bike was just stood there. We uh, Barry's crash helmet on it and just like in the memorial and loads of people looking at it, taking photographs. And, and I was knocking about, you know, and they said, do you want to start a race? And I you was know, treating me like a bit of a celebrity really. So just after lunch, there's some, some going on, people are being moved about. I thought, what's going on here? And uh, anyway, the Duke of Edinburgh trapped with the uh, High Chief Sheriff of Yorkshire and uh, about four or five other blokes that were very smart, looked very fit and were obviously armed. And the Duke was doing a tour around Yorkshire with, with, his, with his friend, this High Sheriff. And uh, he was very, very interested in motorbikes. I had met him once before at Scarborough and had a chat with him. But he, uh, he just came up and... Uh, and, and they put some stand chairs right on this little plateau near the bike. So the Duke could sit on the chair and watch the racing and his chief sheriff and this and that. I'm stood by Barry's bike and he'd come looking at the bike and asking me this and asking me that. And he, I'm quite surprised really because it had been about four years or more since I'd met him before. 
and, and he looked at me, I mean he might have been told, but he said, Fred, he said, this is the Bike Barry Road for you. And I said, yeah it is, yeah it is. <laughs> I'm a royalist, I like royals, but I, I would never say to him, you're Royal Highness or anything like that, because there's nobody better than me. And, and, and I'm equal to everybody, I don't, whether it's a dustbin man or the Prince Philip. So very polite, I said, yeah, yeah, this is the bike, this, that and the other. And we were just chatting about bikes in general. And uh, and he said to this fellow, bring another chair for Fred. So he got this other chair and I sat next to him and we're just chatting away. The other people, when there was a race on, they were confused. Who's leading now? Because the leader soon got mixed with back markers. But the Duke knew, he had his eye on job. Very, very sharp man, he, he knew. It was quite warm, so I took my pullover off and I just had a pair, like a t-shirt and a pair of braces on. And my braces were like a chequered flag, I got them from Goodwood. So I'm strutting up and down, I'm stretching my braces a bit like Bobby Ball and just acting go. And the Duke said to me, Fred, he says, I do like your braces. And I winked at him and smiled. I said, do you know what, old lad, I'm wearing these for a bet. And he looked back at me and smiled and I've seen him smile at other people the same way, just looked back and smiled and nodded. He said, Fred, I think you've won. You know, so, yeah, just, if you talk to people proper, it don't matter who they are, if they're proper people, they will talk to you back, you know, and that was a lovely encounter and I, I never met him again, but I always admired him and uh, a proper chap, yeah, yeah, and, he, and a man of the people, I would say. Yeah, that's another little story with racing bikes. And, Another one, uh, we've been very successful in the Isle of Man. When I was a little lad, four or five year old, Jeff Duke was the world champion, Rod for Norton's. And, and my dad, you know, the conversation with my dad's cronies around the table at night would be, Jeff Duke did this, Jeff Duke did that. And we used to have another visitor at the house called Peter Collins and he, he was world champion speedway rider. I had pictures of Jeff Duke on my, my bedroom wall when I was a kid because my dad always got motorbike cycling books so we cut pictures out and I had them. Always admired Jeff Duke and he, he got let down with people really and the once timed he'd done under Marno a lap on a Norton and he thought he'd done it and, and then they said oh we're 99.999 recurring or something so you know we blink of an eye off it and I'd always admired him. He, he set up a company in the Alamann called Duke Marketing as, as I sort of got known in the paddock in the other man with my bikes and winning races and this and that you know quite often if Jeff was about it he'd, he'd come and say hello you know introduced himself which was marvellous to me I mean they say you should never meet your heroes but uh, I don't know I don't agree with that because he was a perfect gentleman and one day he's uh, we're in the paddock and with a bike just getting it ready to go out and uh, and I, I saw Jeff Duke coming walking down and he had the chief of police of the Isle of Man with him, with his stick and this and that, looking very official. And the governor of the Isle of Man was with him as well. And they're just walking down and he clocked me with my bike. And then when he got to me, he just put his arm on. I said, oh, hang on a minute, you know. So, and he just walked across to me, he said, how are, you, how are you going on, Fred? What's happening? How are you going on in practice? Who's riding your bike? And, and uh, oh, it's a nice note. Well, how much horsepower has that got? I said, You'd have done your 100 mile an hour with this, Jeff. And I was telling him about the horsepower and this and that. Oh, he said, I would have loved a bike like that. He said, you were born too late, Fred. Jeff Duke said that to me. And I said, yeah, yeah. I said, I should have been your mechanic, engine tuner in the 50s, you know. And he smiled and agreed. And all the time, these other two official people are just kicking the feet about, just waiting for him to finish. And, and he turned back and smiled. He said, won't be a minute. And he, we chatted and then off he went. And, Well, is there anything you think you've missed? Anything you'd like to go into yeah, detail? There's not a lot to say. Like my mum, my mum was just a very, very quiet person. I mean, my dad was a bit of an ogre with her. I think nowadays, you know, they probably call it uh, mental abuse, really. My dad wouldn't let her out of his sight. If she went to the shop when she was a bit longer than she should have been, he wasn't very nice with her. A nice, quiet woman who, who just got on with everything. and loved her children and did everything she could for them. And it's a bit sad to say really that all the time I knew my mum, which was 74 years because she's not long been dead, the best time of the years of her life, I think, was after my dad had passed away. Uh, she had the time of her life and continued to have the time of her life and 
till she got a bit old. She, you know, she was nearly 97 when she died, but she could. Uh, she was released. I think. <laughs> yeah, quite a remarkable woman. I mean, she was pregnant at 16. You know, in 1942, she had five children. She she lost a child, uh, all with no NHS. You know, myself, uh, I was born at my auntie's house. My auntie Ada and, and my auntie Ada delivered me. It was all of my mum and her in the house. And uh, it was a re well, November. It was a freezing cold night. You know, my dad were working nights. The, believe it or not, he was weaving asbestos at a place in Rochdale, and they were going about asbestosis and asbestos. I mean, he lived till he was seventy, but that didn't kill him. Yeah, but my mum just held everything together. When I was nine, when I broke my leg, she sat up nights after night with me. It was really painful. And they ended up taking me back in and re-breaking my leg and setting it again, all without anaesthetic care. Not even a bloody injection, they just did it. But yeah, but my mum was a wonderful person and yeah, quite often a loner when I was younger. Not uh, not the particularly best clothes and stuff like that. I used to get a bit bullied and stuff like that at school. You got your brother's clothes on. Her. One thing, my mum used to go to jumble sales and she once got me a jacket and and I've started to wear that and then somebody recognised it as the mum had put it in jumble sales. So that was a bit odd. But uh, that was the way it was then. If you had no money, you just lived off what you could. I don't know, but I had to be careful with money, but I certainly wasn't short of money. Jack Lee's parents, Tom and Mary, is a bit ironic really because uh, it's 20 years between them. Mary had been married once and got Jacqueline, and then she met Tom, who she ended up marrying, and Tom adopted Jacqueline uh, and brought Jacqueline up as his own child. And, but uh, I was seeing Jacqueline when I left home. And Tommy and Mary were wonderful people, we just treated as, you know, she, Good. So anyway, we decided uh, after a while, and I think I'd been living here, there and everywhere on my own. But then after a bit, uh, Jacqueline moved in with me. Oh, that was just a wonderful occasion. Uh, then we decided we'd get married. And had to wait, obviously, for me divorce to come through. Then uh, we decided to get married and the, the wedding was fantastic because we got married uh, at a Methodist church and Jacqueline's uncle, Uncle Ian, He's a Methodist minister, so we married us. We just had a lovely day, but we just invited all the friends. We'd arranged uh, for the do at the Duncan Alsh, but also I'd arranged for some, some KFC bringing in at night, because that's what we did. So we, we did a deal with the Duncan Alsh, we did that. But it was really good. Just invited who we liked, you know, what it was. A friend from France, who, he's died now, and his wife's died. And another, a really, really good friend, a man called Simon Sindorf, a Dutchman. He, he was there with his son, and my great friend Tom Dickey was my best man. And uh, we just had a, a, a wonderful afternoon, really, and, and everybody enjoyed themselves. It was really good. Just exceptional. The people, a lot of my barking friends came. I can't remember how many people were there. But there were a lot of people there, and we really, really enjoyed it. And a lot of people stayed the night, and we got up in the morning, and we had a really nice, big, full English breakfast in what was called the Wormsley Room. And wonderful event. You can. There's a video for that, you know, you can yeah. maybe tap into that.